the making the past. You have been things that break your heart. You have seen things that burn to the fire. It's in your hands to decide. Are we going to respond? No, we are. Are we going to evolve and transcend? Capture the new world away. Exactly what I want to do with my life. I want to be a musician to express myself freely without any limitation, you know, whether technical or mental. And I want to be a psychologist to dig deep into this human psyche, into the social fabric, so I can understand the root cause of human sufferings and how to transform trauma into growth. And I want to be a scientist so I can discover the mechanism before music and healing so I can replicate the results, the solution, and show you how to do the same. It's because all of those aspirations I packed my entire life on two suitcases and flew from Shanghai to Boston. And men's words are lower, so it's easier to reach Judas. And I had this vivid memory when I was three years old where my dad was singing, rehearsing on one side of the room. He was a professional singer at the time. And then my mom and I, <coughs> at the other side of the room, drawing and painting while I moved my little body to the groove, to the rhythm. And in front of me, there's a wall that's covered with our artwork. And even before that precious memory, my mom had been selecting music intentionally for different purposes and to play it throughout my day. She chose music from her Wonderful record. Anyone still know records? Those large records. They are music from uh, Chinese traditional uh, folk songs. Uh, there are music, you know, American jazz and Chinese jazz, Chinese jazz. There are music from uh, the Middle East, from Latin America, from all over the place. European classical, the list goes on. But we did not listen to music for pleasure. She intentionally chose her music to accompany me for different activities. Like I had a playlist for waking up, playlist for meal time, playlist for play, and for winding down to bed. So she cracked the signs of how to emotionally regulate a baby through music. She was using music functionally. And it's today what I do, part of what I do as a new therapist professionally. And there are just so many memories. Um, I had a great hard time to pick when I started talking. Um, I really then remember, you know, when I was finishing my first year in psychology, my granddad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, oh, actually, there's another story I need to tell you before that. It's with my mom. You know, babies, they rely on their caregiver to have this emotional bound to secure attachment. And 90% of 
understand all the brains around what actually happens before I even fight. When I learned all these through my new therapy training, I realized what my mom did for me back then was a huge gift for my life, for my brain development, as well as emotional capacity. Oh, and um, I did not need to see my mom's ambition to feel secure because auditory wise, the music was about and was an action. And I believe that bond, that connection, actually saved my mom's life at that particular moment. It was months before I turned 13, and our car was rear ended by a truck. My dad and I had soft tissue injury, and my mom went into ICU. And she was in a coma for a month, and we only had 15 minutes a day to visit her. When two months later, my mom started to gradually regain her ability to speak. The first thing he told me was, I felt I was going to another world. And suddenly I heard you singing this ukulele. And God reminded me, if the girl is right here, then you're going to another world. You come back here to take care of my little girl. He told me it was that moment I actually brought her back. I'm still just shaking when I talk about that today because it's just so emotional. And also, 10 years later, I find that I use music scientifically to when people are drunk home. That's a big part of it. And then my granddad. Um, after, when I was finishing my first degree in psychology, my granddad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And he was a very, very strong man. Um, in, in his 60s, he, he, uh, he was this strong man who built roads in the mountains of northern China by hand. And, and in his 60s, he, he used to play this fun game together. He would just like, hey, <coughs> grab my arm. And then I would grab onto his arm and he started like, with it, with my weight. We love that game. But as the disease progressed, you know, it took away that part of him. He used to wake up every morning at five and to exercise, but now he's sitting there and not want to move at all. And, and then he started forgetting who he was, who we are. He's forgetting like, what is this? All this play. Why do we need to eat? Why do we need to take a shower? And if you have experienced something like that, you probably understand how desperate and how eager I wanted to reconnect with him. Even though it feels impossible to find all the time. And one day, I was playing my piano. Granddad started to like humming and tapping his feet. And a smile came out of his mouth. Sailor to the dark seas and lane. That was a Shanghainese jazz tune in the 40s. You know, he listened to it growing up. And it was also the first time my mom heard him sing. And that was the moment I feel like my granddad was lost in this maze called Alzheimer's disease and music was the only way to create that neuroplastic with him. And also, the scientists inside of me ask, wow, 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 what's happening? And uh, how, can we, uh, how can we make it more efficient? You know? And then I start to create uh, a beat. I start to change tempo and, and 
changed the river, and I learned a little lesson into the mouth. You know, but guess what? He, he laughed hard, and then he got up and marched to the beach. And that scientific voice brought me to working as a client six years later in Boston in assisted living facility. A patient with Alzheimer's disease and uh, depressive mood disorder. I worked with her twice individual session a day and uh, twice a week individual session a week and twice uh, two group session a day. And I applied the immunotherapy research method called microanalysis. And we mapped out the entire treatment process. And exactly conventional I did with her in the deep And then that Research was published at the New England Region Neurotherapist uh, Conference and then Panama Jazz Festival Neurotherapy Symposium. I named it Creative Emotional Processing Without Method. Before we go to the coda, the musical coda that I prepared for you guys, I want to share one more. And I met George in the rehabilitation center, and he was having a paranoia episode. And he was, he, he believed that everyone around him was evil and tried to harm him. So he fought back and screamed, call my wife to get me out of here right now, you evil. Everyone back away. Like, oh, let's leave him alone. It's... But I did not. I hold my rolling keyboard and approach him. And so many minutes later, we were singing and laughing like a New York family. And he stayed in the rehabilitation for another two weeks. And he never had a paranoia episode. He cooperates with all of his treatment very well. And every time you saw him like from far, far away, he would just wave his hand as I call my name. And all the staff members call this a miracle because he suffered from a traumatic brain injury due to a stroke. He forgot. He forgot that his wife passed away five years ago. And his son is married. And he has grandchildren. He's 72. It's amazing how music, even when all of our other functions fade away, even our memory, even a sense of who we are, Music still moves us. And it turns out that the sense of hearing, not only the first sense we provide with the womb, but also the last one to disappear and die. So now you might be wondering okay, do I need to have music training to benefit? Therapy and all these wonderful things we're talking about. Well, the answer is very nuanced. It's yes and no. Is there anything no? Because we are very lucky as human beings the capacity to express feelings, to connect through music, and to overcome adversity through music is programmed in our genes. We're very, very lucky on that. And neuroscience shows that music and engaging in music is the only activity that activates the entire brain. You know, your brain is on fire, like a party, like a firework. And also, music exists before language. It's a gift 
that helped our ancestors to survive over 35,000 years ago and continues to help us to thrive today. And that is, yes, because from my experience working with people whose relationship with music is traumatized, I do recognize that we do need a nurturing and supportive encouraging environment to activate that musical gene. But that musician is already inside of you, and I can see in each one of you. When we sang that chord at the beginning, it's so beautiful. Can you sing that again? <laughs> See how beautiful you are. You know what just happened? There's over a hundred brains here, just released a tons of oxytocin. <laughs> a chemical that helps us to regulate our emotions, to create bonds and connection, increase trust and empathy. It's free. It's right here. Today you learn how to manufacture it anytime you want. And it's perfectly called your oracle, as most people say. So my question for you to take home and sleep on it tonight is what kind of relationship you want to have with music and what you're going to do to cultivate that relationship into your life. I welcome you to my world today. In my world, music is treated as important as engineering, science, science if not more, and to every problem, we have a musical solution. Thank you.